welcome to the John 3.30 podcast. He must increase, I must decrease, is the message John 3.30 invites us to live. Incorporating this into our everyday lives can be a challenge. What keeps your fire burning? We have many wonderful ways to stay close to our faith, whether it be the Mass, spiritual readings, prayer, adoration, or the Rosary. This is Catholic Faith Life, and here's our host, Jason Nunez. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the John 330 Podcast. This is your host, Jason Nunez, and welcome to episode number 55. Today, I want to welcome a special guest, someone that I've been working on for some time now on on having um, on the the podcast, and I'm happy that he's here now. We have Mr. Dan Chavria. Hey, Dan, how are you? I'm great, Jason. How are you? I'm doing good, doing good. Thank you very much for taking time out of your day here. Thank you for asking me. I'd love to be here. Indeed. Uh, before we get going, we're going to go ahead and say the, the um, litany of humility prayer. So here we go. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come. O oh, Jesus, meek and humble of heart, hear me. From the desire of being esteemed, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being loved, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being extolled, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being honored, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being praised, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being preferred to others, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being consulted, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being approved, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being humiliated, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being despised, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of suffering rebukes, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being calumniated, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being forgotten, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being ridiculed, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being wronged, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being suspected, deliver me, Jesus, that others may be loved more than I. Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it, that others may be esteemed more than I. Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it, that in the opinion of the world, others may increase and I may decrease. Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it, that others may be chosen and I set aside. Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it. That others may be praised and I unnoticed. Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it. That others may be preferred to me in everything. Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it. That others may become holier than I, provided that I may become as holy as I should. Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All righty, Dan, if you can go ahead and do us a favor and share with everyone a little bit about yourself, please. Sure thing. My name is Dan Chavaria. I'm born in Anaheim, California, Whoa. but I've lived in Texas my entire life. Uh, about nine months took us to get here. Um, very unique situation. I have actually lived in the same house my entire life. Uh, really? Bought it from my parents. I'm raising my, my boys there. They're now out in college, and I've um, been in a unique situation. I have a beautiful bride, Becky, who we will be celebrating 25 years of marriage wow. June 19th, so we're very excited about that. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, two wonderful boys, Nicholas, 22, who is studying film at um, College of Chicago, in Chicago, Columbia in Chicago. And we have our son, Daniel, who goes by Danny, who is studying music performance at University of North Texas in Denton. Mm-hmm. So he just mean finished green. Mean Green. He just finished his first year, and he's uh, very excited um, watching both of our sons staying true to their passion of um, the arts has been um, beautiful when you see their final products. And even though neither one of them will admit that they're good, <laughs> we are very proud of them. Um, 
Catholic my entire life, cradle Catholic, as most people would say. Um, love love our faith. Typical journey um, going through you know the the sacraments when they were um, normally given, and a little bit of a struggle when it comes to when you get out of high school and go into college. Yeah. And what brought me back was very unique. My beautiful bride, when we were dating, told me that she didn't feel that we could advance as a couple until we were going to church together. And that Sunday we were in church together, and we've been back ever since. I've been back ever since, I should say. <laughs> um, so. I currently work for Oblate Missions. I do their IT work for them. Um, they're one of the major fundraisers for the Oblate priests throughout the world. I also work for Holy Spirit, um, our church that I, I worship at. I am the middle school youth minister, and I also do the social media for them. been very blessed to have attended Holy Spirit for almost my entire life. There was a brief part where we were going to Holy Trinity with my parents, but when my kids were ready to go to receive their sacraments, we decided that we were going to go our home parish and that's where we came back to so been excited to be there and uh, love everything about a church lovely lovely so taking a step back and looking at the big picture here uh, Credo Catholic um, your husband your father um, you are what I would say is a spiritual leader to many especially with the role that you have in particular at Holy Spirit, um, educating and guiding the middle schoolers. If you want to talk about a tough crowd, that's a tough crowd. I've, I've been in that room where you're up front and you're doing your thing and you do a great job and you, you have you know the support of the volunteers that show up to kind of help keep the kids somewhat focused on, on what's going on. But you do a good job of using fresh, engaging content that will get their attention and that they can take away something, you know, with each class. So I can I, I can only imagine, you know, the hard work that you put in before it's really literally showtime for you on, you know, Sunday evening. Aside from that, you you work with the Oblate Missions. So you're around priests and you're around religious. And if I'm not mistaken, even your father, correct? Your father is a deacon? My father's a deacon, that's correct. So our, our, our faith is very much a part of your life day to day. Absolutely. With that in mind, how do you keep your fire burning for our Catholic faith? I keep my... That's a great question, Jason. And I find that I keep my desire, my fire burning for a Catholic faith by doing my best to continue to learn about it. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest mistakes we make as we become adults, as we become confirmed, is we think we've graduated from our, from our faith. Right, quote-unquote graduated. That's correct. Yep. And that's one of the hardest things that I have found we have to deal with is that myth that we're done. And working with youth has been such a blessing because it teaches you that you have to continue to learn different ways of expressing your faith to an audience who doesn't want to hear about your faith. They're still struggling. They're still learning. They're struggling with just life in general. And you throw God on top of that. It becomes such a challenge to find ways of communicating with them. So we've been very fortunate that there's a program we've been using at Holy Spirit for quite a while, Life Teen and Edge. Mm -hmm. um, they have really invested time and effort into finding material where they meet the teens where they're at, which is a challenge that we constantly have to, to be doing. And I find that by putting that in practice into my own life, just trying to meet people where they're at mm -hmm. helps me to continue to try to learn different ways of expressing and learning and spreading the joy of our faith around to others. And mainly just listening to people's journeys is always a wonderful way of continuing to light your own fire. Um, there's several quotes about um, candles and how your flame doesn't go on out by lighting someone else's flame. Um, so any chance we have to share our journey, our faith journey with others, um, having such wonderful leaders and my parents, um, as you said, been around the Catholic priests my entire life. Mm -hmm. It just seems to make it a little bit more natural um, to want to always continue to be curious about your faith. So... Kind of, for, for those that aren't familiar and those that may be listening that may live in an area where, like, say, they do not offer EDGE or they, they do not offer Lifetime, uh, li life team. kind of give us a Cliff Notes, you know, 101 version of what that program is. Absolutely. Um, Lifetime 
is a high school program that would say uh, every, both of the Lighting the Edge programs are focused on meeting kids and meeting the youth where they're at and trying to spread the word of God in formats and ways that they want to hear it. Um, one of the things they did was they removed, in a sense, the classroom setting uh, where a lot of the kids were, they deal with it all the day, all day long at school. The last thing they want to do is on Sunday have to be in another classroom, mm-hmm. listen to another normal lecture and there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever especially in areas that can't afford it don't have life to an edge but they were trying to be more creative in the way that they're expressing it so what they do is they have a group lesson to where everybody hears the same message from one speaker um, and then they break off into small groups and in the small groups they will cover discussion questions concerning the topics so we can reiterate the message of what they just heard and then the clever thing they do afterwards is they have some way of trying to further the message to make sure the kids understand it by having a activity, whether it's write a poem about what you just learned, come up with a 60-second commercial, come up with a tweet to send. How would you tweet this message? How would you Snapchat this message of what you just heard? This, the different forms of social media, they always try to adapt it, and they're always trying to change it. So you're staying fresh and how would you communicate what you just heard to your friends and to your peers? Mm-hmm. And it's just really and truly trying to show them that God is everywhere, even when they don't realize he is. So that's kind of a cliff note version of it. It's a brilliant program. Um, love everything about it. And I just think that it's done wonders in helping reach kids and help us adults transition that communication gap where we have, where we don't know how to communicate with them. I in in the short in the small handful of times that I've been at 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 it, kind of stepping in for um, for for someone maybe you, you need help and my my wife and I will kind of step in like once a year mm-hmm. <laughs> you know hopefully do more you know coming up here but from what I've noticed there are these great videos that you know they're all engaging and they're all fun and they all have a good message behind them and they you know we, we live in like in a Snapchat we live in a YouTube society we live in a society where it's little clips of things you know little 10 second clips little 2 minute 5, five minute videos that's kind of where the youth's attention span is at right now and these videos that Edge uses it really help it captures their attention for that time um um, I remember during Christmas there was one where there were these guys that were acting out the twelve days of Christmas. Mm-hmm. That that one was so much fun. That that was a good one. And um there was another one it was that same class where they had little kids explaining um the birth of Jesus. And but they had adults acting out what the kids were narrating, mm-hmm. and that that's funny, and it it gets the room laughing and it gets people smiling, and that really opens the door to them engaging in in the lesson, and kind of breaking down that mindset of I don't want to be here. You know, it does. My parents dropped me off. I'm here because my parents brought me here. I don't want to be here. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, and that's always the biggest challenge, especially when dealing with middle school, mm-hmm. is they don't want to be there, and right. that's okay. We. We can't take it personally, and that's mm-hmm. the biggest thing that I always try to tell the volunteers is we can't take it personally. That's where they're at. This is not their first choice of where they want to be. So that's our challenge. How can we get them to engage? Mm-hmm. And I found that Life Teen and Edge, they produce such wonderful material. So I took it a little step further, and I spent a lot of time scouring YouTube. I have friends who find videos who send them to me, and it's just different ways of expressing a message, that whether it's positive whether each year Life Teen and Edge have a new theme. I try to find theme-related videos to show them that they need to start thinking outside the box, that religion isn't just what you hear on Sundays or in your special masses, holy day of obligations. You need to put it in everyday lives, and I try to find videos and ways of them to see that where they can then translate a message and they're in an everyday situation and they it dawns on them, hey, we just saw something similar to this and oh my goodness, this is this is life coming to uh, this is the message coming to life for me. Yeah. So it's um it's a wonderful challenge to have and it another way of continuing to learn about your faith is by how can I turn this message into a lesson for someone else to see. Yes. Um I've I've been in the room when you turn those into teaching moments and those are those are great i walk away from something you know so you know if 
if the middle schooler is there and that defense kind of breaks down, I know they're going to walk away from something as well. Uh, one event that I know that's really good and, I'm, and I know that my son looks forward to is the uh, lock-in. Mm-hmm. Now, from my understanding, you know, it's it's not just a bunch of kids running around the whole night eating candy, eating food. But there's there's a lot of there there are some aspects of our faith that are woven into the evening. Is that right? Always, we always have that part of it. Um, typically, what I tell the kids is in the beginning, I get the first few hours and they get the rest. So this, mm-hmm. the quicker we get through my time, gets them to their time quicker. <laughs> so it helps with getting them in a sense calm and focus on the night where it's not going to just be a night of, you know, doing whatever they want wild and crazy, but it's a... a, a it's an isolated time where we don't normally have just our kids who come on a regular basis. They bring their friends who right. may not be exposed to religion at all or may not hear the message quite often. Then it gives us a chance to reach more kids mm-hmm. and help them just hear a glimpse of what is out there and available to them. And as we always challenge the kids in a group, be Jesus for somebody today. So that's the message we always try to tell their kids. You may be the only form of Jesus someone's going to see today. So that's a big responsibility. This is the challenge that we all have. Yes, and I, I like that because that's one, that's another aspect that I remember is uh, there's always a challenge at, at the end of the edge uh, session. You always kind of leave the group with a challenge to go into the week. Correct. To, 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 to try and do something. And mm-hmm. um, it's kind of like a like um, a call to action or like a, a go forth, you know. Correct. I always tell the kids that they're not going to find a bigger advocate for them being part of our church now. There's always this big discussion with um, when you have the adult part of our church talking about the youth, and they always want to say they're the future of the church. And I always tell them, no, they're the church now. Mm-hmm. They've been baptized. They have been many of them have received their sacraments up to where they can, and they are a full part of our church. And we need to quit excluding them. That's why at Holy spirit it's so nice to see such young ushers that we have now and it's great to see the altar service starting to grow again to see the readers at our life team mass um it's wonderful to see our our youth in action and the more we can encourage that and the more we make that visible the more they feel part of the church and it's always a big discussion because we have um, a lot of traditions in our faith that are there for a reason and they are there to be respected and honored but one of the things that i always try to tell the kids is when they come um, for instance if they go to our adoration chapel there will be times when they'll tell me oh, Mr. Dan we went to adoration and there was um, there was someone there and they were fussing at one of the kids because they said that their dress was inappropriate and, and I told them well I mean you need to remember that they're in a different place and was your dress was the dress inappropriate and they kind of look and think about it and they go well maybe okay <laughs> so you know let's appreciate what they're trying to tell us and then when I see the person who might have made the statement i tell them let's be grateful that they were in adoration we can deal with the rest of it we can work on the dress we can work on the appropriateness of being there right but let's just be grateful that our kids are currently there trying to receive the message and let's shape them into the catholics that we want them to be um so let's work with who, where they're at and that's the whole message of edge and life team meeting teams where they're at and trying to relay a message to them that they may not normally hear Wonderful, wonderful. So, aside from Edge and Life Team, Dan, what what works for you in our faith? What works for me in our faith is a lot how they involve the lay community in spreading the message. Uh, my wife and I have been very blessed to be also part of the marriage sponsorship program there at Holy Spirit, where you get to meet with a lot of the... The, um, the couples who are going through the marriage process and you get to visit with them, you know, five, six times and just talk about your faith journey and your and just being married. And that also helps you as a couple because you get to remember the struggles you had when you were young and sharing your wisdom with couples coming into it. And it helps to break down some of the, I think, the negative stigma of marriage going into it. If you are upfront and honest with people and telling them marriage is going to be something that you need to make devoted to, it becomes a sacrament, a living sacrament that you have to honor and you have to be a part of. You have to make sure that you work at it too. Um, You can't just assume that it's going to be 
taken care of because you got married in the church. It's a constant devotion you have to each other, and you need to make sure you're constantly renewing that. And part of our renewal is to spread our wisdom or our journey with other couples who are going through the process. So that's one way of doing it. Um, just being involved, period. Um, it's uh, always funny because my wife and I have a very similar path that my dad and my mom had. Mm-hmm. My dad is the big yes giver, and my, mom's, my mom has always been the no giver. <laughs> so you have to learn that balance in your family. Um, you know, I deal with friends who will tell me, well, yeah, but, you know, my wife's upset with me because I volunteered for another program. And I tell them, and I will tell yeah, you know, you have to learn to say no sometimes. And that's kind of the balance that you need to have because it doesn't do any good to constantly serve the church if you're not serving your family first. You have to serve your family and then with the time you have available, share that with others. And that was part of my journey to start to work with Faith Formation. I'll never forget it. When they asked me to do the middle school program, I discussed with my wife first and talked to her about the change in our time it would make, and she was supportive of it. And then I talked to my boys. Mm-hmm. And at the time, they were in middle school and elementary school, and they both looked at me like I was crazy. Dad, why are you asking us? Right, right. And I said, because I'm asking y'all to give up some of your time with me so I can work with other kids. And I need y'all to be aboard because if that's something that you don't want to do right now, I'll understand and I'll appreciate that. But if it's something that you don't mind doing, then you know we'll move forward as a family and we'll constantly be asking each other. So I feel very big that you have to constantly be communicating with your kids. Um, and asking them as well. I know that they they can't make the decisions completely, but you need to involve them in the process so they feel that there is value. And again, they feel like they're part of the spiritual journey that you're going on. So those are some of the ways that I find attending acts retreats. Um, I was I, went, I remember I went on my first one because my dad they had been after me forever. My my <laughs> dad and my brother, and it got to the point where I was really turned off just by the mention of it. And so what happened was my dad found out that he was losing his vision. And I told my mom, there was a retreat coming up in my dad's parish in Floresville. And I told her, I'm going to go on the retreat, but I do not want the buildup. So I don't want dad and I don't want David to know about it. Right. So I need you to help me with this. And she says, you got it. So she talked to one of the directors, and they registered me under an alias. I'll never forget. Antonio Pena was the name they registered me under. And um, going to the retreat center, I remember when I got there, one of the team members came out, and he greeted me, and he just told me, Dan Chavaria? I said, yes, sir. And he goes, we've been praying for you for a long time, brother. <laughs> so when we got there and we arrived, they got me into the line. And I just will never forget the look on my dad's face when he saw me there. Mm-hmm. And um, it was just an amazing gift that I had to give him. And then the whole weekend was just beautiful. The the, acts, the whole acts retreat is a beautiful experience that people, if they have the opportunity to go on, they need to go on. Because it's just another way of lighting the fire within you to spread for others. Um, it's just another way of learning more about your faith. My wife had been part of the Acts Retreats for years before me. Women are usually much smarter than men. They find sure. out about these triggers much earlier than we do, yep. and they are able to attend to it. They're open up to it. And she was very patient about how she encouraged me to go. She didn't push it. She knew the time would come. And um, after that, we just it was just a wonderful journey to be part of many teams. And... From there, I've been involved with the Teen Acts, and that in itself is a beautiful process as well, just to see the youth and everything I seem to do, and my wife and I seem to do, is focus on our youth and trying to continue to relate with them. But it's just amazing, Jason, the struggles that they go through today that we were blessed not to have. And many of it is our own doing as a, as adults. We've created society that they're living in and taken advantage of, and that we're now seeing, like, what have we done? Because because they're constantly on their screens. They're constantly right. engaged in other things. Mm-hmm. And we have to find ways of either disengaging them or showing them that they can be engaged, but they need to be engaged in better better topics. There's a couple of things that I want to touch on there that you mentioned. I, I could definitely 100% relate to to what happened with you and with what you, with what you experienced when you went on your retreat. Um, I did something similar. 
uh, even though I'd already gone on a retreat and I'd already teamed on on a couple of retreats, um, this past November or this past fall, I learned that my father and my brother were on a team at the parish back home in El Paso. And the wheels started going in my head. I was like, hmm. I find out that a, a, a childhood friend of mine is the co-director. And it turns out that I knew the director. And I was like, hmm. Just, you know, the wheels started turning. So um, my wife didn't let me drive to El Paso, kind of given what's going on with me and, and my health. So, mm-hmm. you know, and, you know, going on a plane to El Paso is yeah, it's kind of kind of steep there. So I hopped on a train. Oh, wow. Well. And I hopped on a train to El Paso. And I got there that Thursday afternoon, and my niece, Madison, picked me up from the train depot and uh, dropped me off at my mom's. My mom ma- ma- made me uh, some delicious red chila enchiladas that I had not had in a long time. <laughs> I could still taste them. They were so good. And then she dropped me off at church at San Antonio de Pada Parish. Uh-huh. And uh, my father and my brother were, were both there helping, helping with you know the initial festivities. And uh, they see me, and they just assume I just showed up in town. I'm like, hey, you know, cool, you're here. I'm like, yeah, I'm here. And um, they hand me a name tag. <laughs> One of the team members has me a name tag. <laughs> and my dad just stares at me like, what? And my brother's like, what? I'm like, yeah, dude, I'm here. I'm going to go on the retreat. Like, no way. I was like, yeah, I'm, I, I'm not going to miss this opportunity. I'm not going to miss the opportunity to spend this weekend with you guys. It's, uh, as nowhere else, I'd rather be this weekend but here with you guys. And uh, same similar kind of deal. I worked it out with the director to where they put me under an alias. Mm-hmm. Not as quite as far of a stretch as yours. Mine was like Jason Lopez. Mm-hmm. So, you know, somewhat of a stretch but not really. And um, with the role that my father played, he had to know a lot of the, de- the details of of the retreat who's coming who's going to be there so they had to put me under an alias that way he wouldn't find out right away correct and um, so so I got to spend a great weekend with him and I got to meet you know a lot more friends and make some more friends and um uh, many of them listen to this podcast, so it's great. Um, so the father that your the look that, that your father gave you, I can, I I I've seen that look. Yes. So that's so cool. And it's just a it's just such a beautiful memory and a beautiful experience. My dad has been such a spiritual guide, not just for me, mm-hmm. but for uh, thousands of people. Mm-hmm. Um, his faith journey and the journey that he has been has been such a great example for me. I've been so blessed to have such a wonderful spiritual leader um, to guide our family he has been i mean i don't think you could have asked for a better example of how to live your faith in action uh when most of my friends had dads who their their housework consisted of doing the stuff outside which was more very typical when i was growing up my dad was sweeping and mopping floors mm-hmm. and my dad did dishes my dad did everything and my mom asked for something my dad did it he responded um such a positive role model he taught us how to be gentlemen um, open the doors for young ladies. You, you know, you be very respectful for young ladies, and it was just such a a great example. Mm-hmm. And just being able to witness him and my mom's journey as well. I mean, they were involved with Marriage Encounter when it first started mm. um, in the seventies. They were wow. one of the first Spanish presenters. Um, they were they would travel to Mexico where they would give presentations, and we would be at the airport with our little Marriage Encounter signs, and we we're making our little symbols, and we loved, loved <laughs> welcome home lovers. <laughs> and you know, we at the time, you know, it was driving us insane because we had to be there with these little signs on. But now you look back, and there's such cherished memories and we'd be singing the marriage and kind of song there's a new world somewhere they call the promised land and it's just still remember it i still remember it and it was just part of a wonderful journey that they, they put us on my dad was always whenever there was a need he would fill it if they needed a coach on the cyo team no one else wanted to do it he would fill it and i find myself mirroring a lot of what yep. he has chosen what he demonstrated to us yep. and that's kind of how i chose to to do my best to try to lead so whenever I'm faced with a decision, I always put it in God's hands. And it sounds funny. It sounds kind of you know, hokey. Oh, yeah, I'm sure you really do. But I truly do my best to put it in God's hand. And one of the greatest examples I have of that 
is um, I always like to be busy. My wife puts me into work because she says I'll drive her insane if I don't because I'm constantly singing. I'm constantly doing things. <laughs> so she says go send, spend that energy somewhere else so you can come home and you're not as you're not as wind up. So I was doing the social the youth the youth ministry at the church. I was working for the Oblates and I was the, the soccer coach at Holy Spirit for the middle school. Yep. The social media position came up. They asked me to be part of the group that would design the position. So I was part of it and then it came to the point where I was really interested in, to, in applying for it. So I had to step off the designing group um, to keep it fair and my wife says, "Well, I just think it's too much for you to do four things. I think three is your limit. So you need to quit one of the jobs. And she wanted me to quit youth ministry because our programs had gone through, our children had done through middle school program. They were in high school now. She said, you know, you've done your job. And I told them, but I really love working with the kids. Right. So I don't want to give that up. And she says, well, I just really don't think that you need to have four jobs. So you need to pray about it, but we can't do four. So I prayed about it. And I'll be darned if the next day I didn't get a phone call from the athletic director at Holy Spirit Church, I'm in school, telling me that the next year they were not going to have a soccer program. So the one job went away. For you. <laughs> the decision was made for me. Yeah. Um, I was able to apply for the social ministry position, which I now still have. And when I told my wife, she's like, that's not the job I wanted you to give up. <laughs> and I said, I understand. But you told me to ask God to put it in his hands. And this is what he's, where he's directing me. And I share that story with uh, the kids all the time that you have to not only ask, you have to listen. You have right. to see what he wants you to do because many times he gives us directions and we don't want to move our feet in that direction because it's not what we wanted. And unfortunately, that's the hard part of hearing his message and doing what he wants to do because it always seems to take us out of our comfort zone because yeah. he wants us to be, become these great servants and these great disciple men and it's not always the easiest thing to do. So, you know, that can... That goes back to a whole another subject that we probably need to have another journey with Jason because um, growing up is a whole different experience. But now um, it seems to just walk hand in hand with the message we're trying to give. And I know working in youth ministry, you constantly have to be prepared because you never know when you're going to run into your kids. And one of the first things, I'll never forget, one of the this youth minister at a, at a Houston said, oh, he goes, he goes, tell me if you youth ministers out there, if you don't, have never experienced this, because I'm at an Astro game, and I'm sitting there, and I see, I'm with my friends, and all of a sudden, this one kid comes up to me, and he says, hey, hey, Mr. Brian, how are you? And the, there's three things going in my head. Do I need to apologize for what I'm doing? <laughs> what was I doing? <laughs> and do I need to start calling my priest and ask for forgiveness? <laughs> As a youth minister, as someone who's leading your community, you have to be aware that there's always eyes on you. And it's not an easy task. And many times when you get caught in the grocery store, you, you're you just being yourself. And sometimes you may not be the best version of yourself. And you have to think it for a second, was I doing anything that I needed to explain? And it's kind of a constant challenge to always be the best version of you that you can be. So um, it opens your eyes to many different things on your journey. It does. It does. I, I There's a question that I have that I want to ask you, but unfortunately we're going to have to be pretty vague about the responses, though. Okay. But, but so thinking about – now, I've, I've never I've, – I've – I chaperoned on 18 Axe Retreat, and you and Becky do a great job with that. When when you two are at the helm, it's 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 fantastic. Not to say anything about anyone else that has a partner, but you two specifically do a great job with the kids and with the Teen Axe Retreat. I've been in a in in the room when you're at Edge, and sitting at a table with these kids that literally don't want to be there. And I've been in a room chaperoning where these kids are having the time of their life and these are the same kids for the most part mm -hmm. how does it drastically change how does it go from them not wanting to be there to their having the time of their lives and even seeing them on Saturday evening and nothing but smiles and seeing them come back on Sunday for mass and you know, the arms around each other and the group picture is always great. You know, seeing everyone so tight, you know, next to each other. 
they're like different kids when they come back. Mm -hmm. It starts with, I mean, when the the teen acts, the credit goes to the the, the teen team members who are sharing their journey mm -hmm. with the other teens and showing them that the struggle is real, that your struggle is similar to my struggle, and. In the Edge and the Life Team program, it comes with the core members who share their spiritual journey, who walk with the kids, who also are vulnerable, make themselves vulnerable in sharing their struggles. And it helps the kids understand that you're not alone. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the biggest message that kids want to have um, acknowledged is that they're not alone. And one of the things that I've learned in working youth ministry is, yes, in middle school, they have what we as adults consider crushes. Mm -hmm. But to them... That at that moment is just as real as any love that we've shared with our partner. So we have to acknowledge that. And when we minimize that, we find that that's when they stop wanting to talk to us because we're, in a sense, telling them that your feelings are not as valid as mine. And if you want to truly connect with the, with the teens, you have to acknowledge that what they're experiencing to them is just as real as what we have. We know that they're going to mature. We know that their feelings are going to mature mm -hmm. and that they're going to understand and grow into a greater understanding of what the relationship and the, and the meaning of love is. But to acknowledge that what they're going through right now is real helps to connect with them so much. And when they don't want to be there, acknowledging to them, I know you don't want to be here and I'm okay with that. But give us a couple of times. Come, come a few times. And if in the few times you don't want to be here, I'll talk to your parents and I'll tell them not to bring you back. And they kind of look and they're like, what? I said, I'll talk to him because if you don't want to be here, I don't want you to be here because then you become a distraction for everybody else. Right. And you're, your lack of desire to be here then infects the rest of the group. So let's let's be honest. If it's not something you want to do, let's talk to your parents about it. You know, but give us a chance first. On the Teen Act Retreat Weekend, hearing the testimonies that these kids are willing to give, which is just incredible, their journey, their own journeys helps open up the eyes of the other teens and usually you know on on the adult retreats it takes us a you know while to loosen up and to become open to the experience these kids by the end of the the first day are usually feeling it they're usually feeling the vulnerability they are knowing they know they're in a safe place they almost forget that they are sharing details of our struggles that they have that they wouldn't only share with other people mm -hmm. and i think just knowing that you're part of a journey that there's other kids who are on the journey with you and willing to walk the journey with you and that they're not perfect when none of us are perfect. And I think that's the biggest struggle and the biggest myth that we need to break down, that those who lead these programs are perfect because none of us are. Um, I make just as many mistakes as everybody else does. The, the difference is we learn to ask for forgiveness for our mistakes and we learn that we can be forgiven for the errors we make. And on the retreats, these kids just hear so many different stories that they can relate to. And it makes you feel that you're not alone. And the more we can engage and others know that we're with them and supporting them on the journey, the more they feel they're included and part of something. And I think that's the biggest struggle we have as a faith. And um, right now we're losing so many of our kids. Once they leave high school, mm -hmm. within six months, a good, well-spoken atheists can convert them from Catholicism to no religion whatsoever because they have questions and they have statements that they can make that our kids aren't always ready to defend or to understand or to comprehend or to battle back. Mm -hmm. So we as adults need to, to, to do our part and to try to continue to educate our kids and let them know the importance of our faith. And Life Teen, Edge, Teen Acts are all... Um, tools that we're using to reiterate this message. Some of the kids that we've made and we've seen um, through the Teen Acts, through all of our programs, are just such well-rounded kids, and you see them, and you know when they go off to college, they're going to be the ones that others look to for answers. So it's just such an incredible journey to be part of. It's, it's important that you mention um, the whole aspect of not minimalizing what they're going through. Because I, I, I can understand that, and I, I can kind of see maybe where I've done that. And that's something that they can help me even with my kids, you know, and not minimize what they're going through. And kind of see how when you do that, that's where maybe that defense comes up. Mm -hmm. Or that's where, you know, the, the bond may have been broken somewhat because uh, you're not seeing it at their level. 
Correct. And that's the toughest thing to do because we know we've been experienced. And, and I think a lot of times I tell the kids um, as we become more and more an adult and we start doing adulting things, mm-hmm. um, we lose that child innocence and we lose that ability to see the natural joy that they have just as life. And we start pecking away at it a little bit at a time and not, not intentionally. It just happens in our actions and what we do. Um, you know, if they get a high score in the video game, it's not something that maybe interests us tremendously, but to them, that's a big deal. Right. And then when we don't acknowledge that, then they seem to kind of lose interest in telling you. Uh, I know that my oldest son, Nicholas, when he gets home from college, he is a chatterbox and I love everything. <laughs> minute of it and he just talks nonstop and there's things that you you need to be doing but there are also things that you can wait and just listen to him because he just is sharing his beliefs he shares his views he shares his opinions on movies and why this is dumb and why he doesn't like this and why he doesn't like that and you listen and you acknowledge and you validate and they leave knowing that what they have to say matters Um, Danny, the same way, he is not afraid to share his journey with us and struggles with us. And he talks to us about some of the struggles he has going to school and being away from school, um, being away from home, Mm -hmm. and how the first semester was easier than the second because the first one, everything was new. The second semester, it's kind of settling in the reality that you're not at home and you got to do adult things. And it's not always fun. And... We need to remember to to keep our kids kids as long as possible and to support them, to attend their games, to be the spiritual leaders that we need to be. And one of the greatest things that I've been able to do working and trying to recruit people is, number one, I believe when you're recruiting someone to work in faith formation as a volunteer, personal invitation is always the best way of doing it. Right. I will seek people out who I just see on a regular basis attending mass, who I see as someone who would be a great perspective. And many times they don't see themselves as that type of person. And you encourage them to come and you tell them the lesson plans are done. We need you just to come and walk with the kids and be a a spiritual journey. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget there was one man who came up to the table and he said, okay, Dan, I see you all the time. Give me, give me your 30 second reason why I need to do this. And I said, okay, 30 seconds. You got it. I said, I don't know if I'm not going to time this, but let's just see. I said, for many years and for too long, the women have been the spiritual leaders of the family. It's not the role to be the spiritual leader. It's the role to be the spiritual heart. It's the man's, it's the man's job to be the spiritual leader. So if your child is asking you to lead, why not start with it in the catechism? And he'd like to, somebody else give me an answer. I, that one was too difficult to deal with. <laughs> I tell men this all the time when I'm trying to recruit them, when I'm trying to encourage them to come participate. Having a male role model in the classroom, whether he's presenting or whether he's just physically there, has such a significant increase in helping keep young men involved in their faith. I've um, kind of looked at the spiritual, being a spiritual leader of your family, and I've seen some studies that are older now, but one study I saw was very eye-opening and said when the, the mom is a spiritual leader of the family, when the teens go to high school... 77% of them are likely not to continue their faith. And when the dad is the spiritual leader, it was like 83% will continue on because they saw the dad lead them to church. So those are staggering statistics that if us men would continue to embrace, we would continue to um, act on, it would continue to help keep our kids interested in faith. It would change the whole dynamics, I think, of what we're trying to accomplish. And just being in the classroom, whether we're actually delivering the message or just being there to reinforce the message that faith is important, faith is cool, would help tremendously. Certainly would. So for anyone listening, if you happen to be in the San Antonio area, and you know, you've got some spare time on some Sunday evenings during the school year. Get in touch with me. I'd be happy to get you in touch with Dan. And um, you two can have a conversation about um, helping out with Edge. <laughs> Absolutely. Andy. Hey, guys. I'm going to take a quick break here. I have a quick question for you all. Do you want to support the podcast? Well, you can. You can help the John 330 podcast by working with our sponsor. When you need to buy or sell a house anywhere in the country, even in Canada, Please give Rob DeMaio a call. You may um, 
Remember Rob from episode number 27 when he appeared with his wife, Camille? He's an experienced, award-winning realtor and can help you find an exceptional agent at no cost to you. Think of him as your real estate matchmaker. Just call him, tell him your needs, and he'll connect you with exactly the right agent in his extensive network. You can call or text Rob at 210-488-1144. Again, that's 210-488-1144. Tell him you heard it right here on the podcast. Now, back to the show. Uh, Well, Dan... um Thank you very much. We're going to go and get to our parting questions here. Okay. So the first one is, if you could have a superpower, what would it be and why? Wow. Superpowers to become really great, especially with all the superheroes now that they're bringing to life. Um, mm-hmm. I think that the one that I would want would be the superpower of healing. So many people need that, and I think that would be a great one to have. If you had that superpower, I would personally drive you to... To um, to Dallas every Sunday when the Cowboys played, and I I personally write a letter to Jerry Jones and say you need to have him on your staff. And I would do it. And have him travel with the Dallas Cowboys so that way if something happens to someone, you can Mr. Miyagi them and get them back on the field. And I would gladly fill that role, Jason. <laughs> Guarantee. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, for those that are picking up there, Dan's a Cowboy fan. I'm a Cowboy fan. So we're we. We share our joys and we share our sorrows every Sunday. Um, oftentimes, I'll see him and he's like, "I don't, I don't, don't, dude, don't tell me," because he hasn't seen the game yet. Because he spends his Sundays at at, at at Holy Spirit, working and preparing for Edge that evening. So if they play at noon, if they play at three, and I happen to see Dan around eight picking up my son from Edge, he's like, "Don't, don't tell me. I don't want to know. I don't want to know yet. Someone already told me. I don't want to know." But still. <laughs> So. And it becomes a teaching moment too, Jason, because many times the kids would make fun of me, especially when the Cowboys would struggle, yep. and they'd tell me, Mr. Dan, you need to pick another team. And I said, just like in life, when you would struggle, I would not abandon you. I would not abandon my Cowboys. Good one. Good one. I'm going to remember that. I'm going to write that one down. So can I use that too? <laughs> Absolutely. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> Who is your favorite saint? Another great question. Um, you know, obviously want to be St. Daniel. Um, you know, you have St. John Paul. But I would have to probably say St. Anthony de Barua. Uh, it's always been, that was my confirmation name. Um, any saint who is a saint of lost items and lost souls is just something that I want to be a part of. Beautiful, beautiful. If you could describe how you live your faith with a hashtag, what would it be? Wow, great question. Um, let's see. I would have to say, hashtag leave it up to God. Hashtag leave it up to God. So before we've, before that, we have seen that through the pot of prayer for us. And hashtag leave it up to God. Yes, correct. Love it, love it. What message do you want to leave our listeners with? The message I want to leave everybody with is you don't have to be a master of your faith to help and to be on the journey with others. Um, Many times just being involved is a great way of sharing your faith with others, especially in the middle school, high school, elementary school settings. The, The lessons that we learn from our youth... Is, is worth the effort of just showing up on the Sundays. So just be involved. Beautiful. Just be involved. And who would have thought it could be that simple, right? Correct. With now 55 episodes in, kind of a common factor that I'm seeing is that, being involved. Not, not straying away. Just staying involved in some way or another. And um, you touched on a very important point earlier, you know, especially relating back to, say, coming back from an action retreat. You come back and you're on a fire. And especially for for men, you know, you, you want to be an usher. You want to be elected. You want to be the next of Columbus. You want to be on the next team. You want to be the director of the next team. You want to bring your dad, your brother, your neighbor, every guy you know on the next retreat. And you want to do all this stuff. But, you know, again, we need to remember that we have a family at home. And and it's important that not only are we spiritual leader to to our brothers, but to our family at home, especially Absolutely. to our wife and our children who we are trying to get to heaven. Absolutely, and get as many people there as you can. Indeed, indeed. Well, Dan, I want to thank you for taking time out of the evening and sharing with us what keeps your fire burning for our Catholic faith. Um, 
In John 3.30, we do find that he must increase, I must decrease. I want to give a special thanks to Ruben here at Oblate Renewal Center for allowing us to record this particular episode on Holy Ground. That means so much to us. Thank you very much, Ruben. And a special shout-out and thanks to Dr. Jeff Vesta, who is our executive producer. Thank you, Dr. Vesta, for your continued support of the John 3.30 podcast. If you'd like to be a guest... Uh, by all means, send me an email. You can do so to john330podcast at gmail.com. Or if you like our Facebook page, send me a message that way. I'd be happy to go ahead and um, work out a date and time. Whether you live in San Antonio, we can meet at Oblate. Or if you do not live in San Antonio, we can record the episode through Skype or through a phone call. I, I've had previous guests on, such as um, um, Sean Bryan, the, the Papal Ninja, or um, uh, Brian Mercier, uh, or otherwise known as Kathy Bryan of uh, YouTube fame and a professional Catholic speaker. We recorded those episodes through Skype. So we're not limited to people in San Antonio only. Um, I'm going to continue my, my thank yous for those of you that have purchased a t-shirt. I'm still kind of on my long list of people back home in El Paso that purchased a shirt. You guys definitely blew me away with that. And uh, once again, thank you to my parents and to my brother and my sister for putting together that t-shirt fundraiser. Um, that is helping me with um, some upcoming projects that are coming up here in the future. And one of those projects is we are taking the show on the road. My wife and I will be heading to Irving, Texas. Um, as of release of this episode, we will be in Irving, Texas the following weekend. So when you're hearing this, next weekend, my wife and I will be in Irving, Texas at Steubenville Lone Star, which is a wonderful, wonderful conference um, associated with Life Team, if, if, if I'm not mistaken. That's correct. Uh, Father Mike Schmitz will be there, um, a couple of other great speakers, and we are blessed to be there as an exhibitor. So my wife and I will be there, we'll be set up at a table, and we'll be promoting the John 330 podcast there to everyone that is attending and everyone that's participating. So keep an eye out on social media for pictures from, from Steubenville Lone Star there and Irving. Um, those of you that have purchased a shirt have helped me get there by helping us get there and kind of putting together some additional promotional items that will help spread the message of, of this podcast. So I want to thank uh, Fernandez Rodriguez. Thank you, Laura Rodriguez, Lorenzo Sanchez. Janice uh, Valderrama, Mr. and Mrs. Charlie Cassiano, Charlie, who was a previous guest as well. Thank you for your support. Gloria Martinez, uh, Armida De La Rosa, Angel Torres, Dr. Mena, who was another previous guest. Dr. Mena, thank you for your contribution. David Valdez, David, thank you so much for being a fan of the podcast, for listening, for commenting, for liking, and for purchasing a shirt. Thank you so much. Um, Andy Rios, Raul Bernal, my brother, my blood brother, Joe Nunez, uh, Judy Aguilar, thank you. Thank you for your support. Yvette Sylvando Rojas, my sister and my brother-in-law, thank you too. Um, as well as Emma, Nini, and, and, uh, and Elias, thank you guys for your support. And of course, my parents, mom and dad, thank you guys for this. I will have more thank yous to come. And um, thank you once again from the bottom of my heart. And it definitely means the world to me that you guys are supporting me in this. Cannot thank you enough. Uh, we are going to end this episode the way the Nunez family ends our time in Mass uh, every time we attend, and that is by saying the intercessory prayer to St. Michael the Archangel. So here we go. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Sometimes there's cast, sometimes there's thrust. So we need to kind of get with the Vatican and finally, once and for all, decide, is it... Is it be our defense or be our safeguard and is it cast or is it thrust into hell so we just kind of need to get that into into finalize once and for all for everyone there <laughs> but Dan once again thank you for your time I really appreciate it I appreciate the journey I can't wait to come back oh yeah yeah and everyone thank you for listening have a good rest of your day and God bless you all
must increase, so I must decrease. And now my heart is open wide. I must decrease, so.